Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. It's the 12th anniversary of the occupation of Afghanistan. There's major protests and killings in Egypt right now. The elections are taking place in Azerbaijan, um, in central eastern Europe. And we're talking about oil, gas, uh, pipeline politics. What links all of this? Not to mention tar sands protests from uh, Canada to the United States, the linkages. Um, over the weekend, there were vigils held around the world um, to release 28 environmentalists and two journalists uh, facing piracy charges in uh, Russia. They're now known as the Arctic 30, detained in a Greenpeace action directed at Russia's first Arctic offshore oil rig last month. Uh, the Netherlands has filed legal action against Russia in a bid to win their release. Um, our guests, again, Timothy Mitchell of Columbia University, James Marriott, he has a new book, The Oil Road and Alna Galkina from L uh, London and the group called Platform. Um, you're from Moscow originally. What's happening with this oil protest? Um, so the activists were detained, like you said, a few days ago, and uh, they're now being uh, being held on the. Um, on, on this piracy charge. This is the first time that uh, Russia has uh, done anything like that. I mean, obviously, uh, the uh, political arrests and uh, detentions and uh, long-term prison set sentences are applied against um, Russian activists, Russian citizens, on a kind of daily basis. But this is the, the first time in recent history that Russia has done anything like this um, to citizens of other countries. Um, so. In a way, this story is going to um, majorly play into the um, uh, international relations between the Russian government and, and, and the West, seeing as it involves. Let's talk about the um, Arctic drilling and why mm -hmm, Russia mm -hmm. is doing it and the movement against it. Sure. Um, so the. Um, the, the rig that uh, that the action is directed against is uh, the first to be um, uh, drilling for oil uh, extraction dr drilling rather than exploration in uh, in the Russian Arctic seas. Um, it's got a very uh, dodgy history. In fact, the top half of the rig was taken from a decommissioned North Sea oil platform, uh, which was then sold on to Russia and uh, put on the bottom supports from um, of, uh, constructed separately and um, uh, a decade previously um, in, in, uh, in Arctic Russia. And so, uh, I want to mm, play mm -hmm. a video that Greenpeace released of us, um, uh, of the Arctic Sunrise captain, the ship is called the Arctic Sunrise, Peter Wilcox, filmed in handcuffs just after Russia's raid on the ship. In between Russian translations, he described what happened after the Russian agents descended from a helicopter by rope and boarded the ship. They just uh, uh, pushed everybody into the mess. That's the room where we eat. Mm -hmm. And left me on the bridge. And after a while, they let people go to their cabins. So the Russian journalist filmed him while uh, this Greenpeace activist, captain of the Arctic Sunrise, was in handcuffs. Anna. That's right, yeah. And the significance of what's happening to them, them being charged with piracy? Um, the significance of this is that the Russian government is trying to make this about a, um, an attack by the West on Russian sovereignty. You've seen uh, a trend of this with the Russian government in the past couple of years, since the huge pro-democracy movement uh, last year, the Russian government has been trying to um, uh, to paint any kind of uh, dissent as much as it can as something done by foreign agents. Um, that is literally the words that they use. And so, um, in a way, the action, the, the action by uh, these Greenpeace activists uh, is something that, that is pretty easy for them to, to paint as this is the West coming to, um, coming to, um, to impinge upon our sovereignty, impinge upon our oil. Um, but what we need to understand is that this is not uh, simply Russia being autocratic. This is um, also the Russian government being run by two oil companies, Gazprom and Rosneft, whose uh, board and whose senior management are intricately connected to uh, the uh, to the very top of the Russian government and to um, uh, to power structures such as the, the FSB, used to be KGB. James Marion, I wanted to ask you, uh, you're with the group Platform. You've been studying and protesting oil companies for, for a long time. Um, do you believe, first of all, in, in 
working with oil companies on projects and, and, and making deals, as, as some environmental groups do. And, and what's your take on <laughs> what do you think people need to know about these large companies that control so, you know, such important resources? Uh, well, the, the answer to the first question is no, we don't. Um, that's quite simple. We work very closely with the communities who are impacted by oil and gas developments. Occasionally we work with labor unions who are in, in, in the oil industry itself. Our job is to try and highlight the social, environmental and democratic risks and human rights risks of oil and gas production globally. Uh, the key thing we had to understand, about, I think, also about these structures is the way in which they interact with not only with the provision of energy but crucially with the with the wider set of concerns Timothy uh, Timothy's book um, is brilliant at looking at the relationship between oil production and democratic development or de de-democratization as you carefully put it um, in the 20th century there's also the, the obvious issue of the way in which these structures drive forward climate change essentially an oil company is set up to do one thing which is to generate a return on capital the companies such as BP or Shell wouldn't really be in oil production if it wasn't generating cash return on cash if otherwise they'd make their money out of spaghetti the point is that they, they do these projects to generate a key return on capital, and oil can provide that. But in the process of doing so, they drive carbon from the lithosphere, from underneath the ground, into the atmosphere. It's, in a sense, they help create a conveyor belt, moving carbon from beneath the geology into the atmosphere, which, of course, drives forward climate change. So the thing that people need to understand is that we need to shift radically beyond these structures. We need to find another way of energy provision which doesn't drive forward climate change and also at the same time ideally would be a structure of energy provision which develops democracy, develops and assists human rights, doesn't impact on local environments in the way that these structures do. Timothy Mitchell, what do you mean by carbon democracy? But to understand democracy, you've got to understand how throughout the last 100, 150 years, both in industrialized countries and in, in, in other parts of the world, the, what democracy is, whether democracy has been possible, has been intricately related to forms of energy production, coal in the coal age, uh, oil and other um, energy systems today. And, and that in developing, in engineering forms of supply of energy, countries are making themselves more or less vulnerable to uh, forms of democratic democracy demand democratic um, uh, claim, uh, extraordinarily vulnerable in the first half of the 20th century, why, which is why one saw the rise of, of forms of mass democracy based on forms of basic so, uh, social welfare to people, and less democratic in the second half of the 20th century as both oil and other energy producers and their governments have found ways to insulate uh, the energy supply system from the forms of political action uh, that it used to be much more vulnerable to, so that now the battles are waged uh, by green Greenpeace activists in, in, in the Arctic coast of um, off Alaska or, or over the Keystone Pipeline uh, and, and, and the project to extend it um, across the United States. And these are the sites not just about energy and climate change, uh, but also about the forms of democratic politics we're going to have. Are we going to have a form of democratic politics in which we can take on board the, the, the concerns about uh, climate collapse, for example, or not? Those who are for um, uh, pushing forward with the so-called unbridled capitalism, um, often support these huge pipeline projects, but they're hardly um, free enterprise. They so involve state subsidies at every level. James Marriott, if you could explain that, from tar sands to the uh, major pipeline from the Caspian. To That's absolutely true. I mean, uh, when there was a, a key interview, an interesting interview between the CEO of uh, uh, BP and um, the Financial Times, in which he famously said, we can't build this pipeline without free public money, free public money. Um, it was a little bit of a slip, I think, on John Brown's r behalf, but he g gave, the, gave, the, gave the lie there, really, to the, to the point, which is that they crucially needed public money, and that they needed it at a low interest rate, and therefore this pipeline in the Caucasus was essentially underpinned and supported by the World Bank or the IFC, which is um, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, and on that as well, and, on, and the export credit agencies around the world, and on that foundation, then the commercial banks could come in behind it. Without that public 
take money, it wouldn't have been possible to construct it on anything like the terms that the companies wanted to do, as I say, to generate return on their own capital. And we see that pattern repeated again and again. At the moment, there is a push to create, and is there is a political and financial construction of another pipeline running through this area, a gas pipeline, which would t take Azeri gas through Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, through uh, Greece uh, and Albania into Italy, and then would feed into the European gas grid. It's what we call the Euro-Caspian Euro mega pipeline. It's a set of three different pipelines. But interestingly enough, at the AGM of the European Bank of Reconstruction in Istanbul, once again, the key driver behind this, a guy called Al Cook, who's in, from BP in Azerbaijan, said, we need public money for this. We cannot do this without public money. Of course, he's making a pitch, but he's very true, which is that this has to be underpinned by money from the public coffers. Not only because it's just dollars, but crucially, it's state-backed dollars, that the states in these instances, export credit agencies or the, the, uh, of Italy, Germany and so on, will come in and support an infrastructure project in the event of there being a problem, such as we've seen throughout the hi history of the 20th century, where populations push for their own democratic control and you get a process of what is being called nationalization. We just have one minute to go. What most surprised you in researching the oil road? The thing that most surprised me was the, was the way in which the same substance, this crude oil, which is the same substance that passes through a pipeline in the, in the Caucasus and through a pipeline in, 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 in uh, European, Western Europe, it has a completely different impact on the populations that it passes through, because in, in the Caucasus, it's a securitized um, corridor. It's a militarized corridor. In, 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 in Italy and Austria and, uh, and Germany, it's not in the same way anything like that. And therefore, its impact, the same material, its impact on the people who live alongside it is utterly different. And we in the West are so blind to the impact that it has in that first part of its transit. We have to leave it there. I want to thank you all for being with us. Uh, James Marriott is co-author of a new book. It's called The Oil Road, um, uh, Journeys from the Caspian Sea to the City of London. Carbon Democracy is Timothy Mitchell's book. Um, and Anna Galkina is with the group Platform, along with uh, James Marriott. That does it for our show.